In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve the Schrodinger equation in a cylindrical infinite potential well. So, uh, first I'm going to tell you what an infinite potential well is. It's a specific type of potential function that you see in quantum mechanics, uh, and it's a piecewise defined function where it's, it has an infinite value everywhere in 3 space except for some finite volume closed off cavity where it's zero inside that cavity. Now that's not a potential you can just insert into the Schrodinger equation and start solving directly like you can with other more normal potentials. Um, but you can quite simply simulate it by matching its effects using other mathematical techniques. So basically, because you can't just insert it into the Schrodinger equation and start solving, the approach is to solve the Schrodinger equation in free space and then um, simulate the effects of the potential exactly by imposing boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are based on the effect we know such a potential would have. Uh, we know that if uh, there is only one region where the potential is zero and that it's infinite everywhere else, that it's g the, the electron is going to be totally confined in that region. So we know, therefore, that the wave function has to be zero everywhere where the potential is infinite, and we know that it can be non-zero where it's zero inside the cavity. And we also know that it must be continuous, so it must go to zero at the boundaries. Therefore, we can simulate the effect of the, the infinite potential well potential function by setting just by choice the wave function equal to zero uh, everywhere outside the potential function or everywhere outside the potential well where the potential function is infinite and then solve the Schrodinger equation in free space for what's going on inside the potential well and then just impose the right boundary conditions on that free space solution to make the overall wave function continuous meaning we need to make the free space solution go to zero at the boundaries of the potential well so this is the free space Schrodinger equation and since our problem is cylindrically shaped. The boundary conditions that simulate the potential function are cylindrically shaped, and therefore it's easiest to use cylindrical coordinates. That way the boundary conditions can be imposed by setting the wave function equal to zero on certain uh, coordinate surfaces, so just certain constant values of the coordinates. So then inserting this into the Schrodinger equation gives us the free space Schrodinger equation in cylindrical coordinates. And I've stuck quantum numbers on the energy just in anticipation for how the problem's going to work out. So the boundary conditions that we need to simulate the potential well are just to have the wave function go to zero when z is zero and when z equals to the length of the potential because that gives us the two ends of the cylinder. And then we also need it to go to zero for some radial value, which causes, or it gives us the uh, sides of the cylinder. <clears throat> now this is a separable partial differential equation, so we're going to use separation of variables. Before I do that though, uh, I multiplied this constant to the other side, uh, and then I combined it with the energy in this A constant, just to make things easier, to make the algebra easier. Then I separated the Z coordinate first from the radial and the phi one in the standard separation of variables way. I had a, I split the solution into two factors which depend on separate variables, stuck that in the differential equation and divided by the solution. Then I added this to the other side and uh, subtracted that to the other side which gave me this. And then I set both sides which are now uh, dependent on only entirely different variables. I set them equal to a separation constant and I picked this particular value for the separation constant because that's what ends up causing the z solution to satisfy the uh, z boundary condition up here that gave us the ends of our cylindrical potential well. So this is the differential equation. Uh, manipulating a little bit to be a bit easier to work with. We find that there are two solutions, sines and cosines of course. But even with this value for the separation constant, the cosines do not satisfy the boundary conditions, but the sines do. So then we have this uh, value for the z factor, which satisfies the differential equation and the boundary conditions. Uh, 
So then there are two things we need to do. First, we need to look and see how this actually satisfies the boundary conditions and therefore see the reason for picking this particular value for the separation constant. And then we also need to normalize the solution. <clears throat> so first, uh, the boundary conditions were that for z equal to 0 and z equal to L, the wave function has to equal 0, which will happen if this h of z equals 0 for those same boundary conditions because uh, the wave function is proportional to h of z. So then, um, if z equals 0, then of course sine equals 0 because the whole argument equals 0. And if z equals l, then that cancels the l in the denominator and leaves some integer times pi in the argument, which is always a 0. But there are multiple different zeros, so we find that there are automatically already multiple different states that satisfy the boundary conditions and the wave function, which means there are different quantum states uh, that will end up corresponding to different energy values that the electron can exist in. And there are actually more than just what are indexed by n. We'll see that when we calculate the other variable factors. <clears throat> so then that, that's how we got this to satisfy uh, the boundary conditions. And we see that there are multiple solutions that correspond to different quantum states. The only thing we have to do then is to normalize it, and when we perform the standard normalization procedure, we find that the normalization factor is root 2 over L. So this is the normalized uh, Z factor, which solves the Schrodinger equation and also or satisfies the required separated off piece of the Schrodinger equation and also the required boundary conditions. So then over here, we've got this other equation, which is dependent on the radius and the polar angle. So I just carried it through some manipulations here. Uh, and then ultimately arrived at this. And this is more favorable for separating the radius from the polar angle because there's only one term that depends on the polar angle. At least there will be once we split this into... Uh, separate factors and divide by the solution. <clears throat> so then doing that, I chose j of r and f of theta arbitrarily for the uh, two variable factors. So then inserting it, dividing it, we find that we have only one term that depends on theta. We subtract that to the other side, set both separated sides equal to a traditional m squared separation constant. Then we have this equation for the angular factor, and it's the same equation as for the z factor, but the boundary conditions are different. We don't need it to go to zero for specific values of theta, but we do need it to be single valued, meaning we need, when you go around once uh, and you arrive back at where you started, we need this uh, factor to have the same value it did when you started, and that's only possible if m is an integer, so that gives you that we have another quantum number that indexes different quantum states that will correspond to different en energies. Uh, so we have multiple solutions that satisfy the differential equation and the boundary condition, and that is for m equal to an integer. So then normalizing gives us this. The standard normalization procedure gives us this. The reason why the normalization factor is different than in the z factor case is because the boundary conditions were different, so then the particular solution that we had to select to satisfy those boundary conditions most generally was different, and as a result the normalization factor is different. Okay, so now we've got the radial equation to solve, so pulling that off um, and <clears throat> manipulating a little bit to get it more ready for solving, we recognize immediately that this is the cylindrical bezel equation, so then its solution is this uh, cylindrical bezel functions with the argument r times the square root of whatever constant is multiplying that r squared there. Now we need this to satisfy the radial boundary conditions. Uh, well, there's only one, the radial boundary condition, uh, so that the whole wave function does. If we impose that the radial factor is zero, uh, when the radial coordinate takes this value, capital R, then the whole wave function will be properly zero. And it's the only part of the wave function that's radially dependent, so we have to impose the boundary condition on that part to get the boundary condition satisfied by the overall wave function. We can do that by 
setting this constant here in these parentheses, the inner parentheses, equal to the square of the roots of the mth bezel function over the square of the value of the radius of the potential well. When we do that, the bezel equation becomes that, and the solution becomes this. Now, uh, first, the normalization factor here is just 1, so we don't have anything to add there. And second, uh, you can see that this, in fact, does satisfy the boundary condition, because when r equals uh, this capital R, it cancels and just leaves in the argument these constants, which we defined as the uh, roots of the bezel function. Now, that satisfies most generally the differential equation and the boundary condition, but we've got a lot of choices. We could pick any bezel function, and we could pick any root of the bezel function. So here we have an even larger multiplicity of states on top of the, uh, the already numerous ones that we have because we can pick any integer n for this factor here. So we've got a lot of different discrete quantum states that are allowed. Of course, uh, we had to pick an, an integer for n for the boundary conditions to be satisfied, and we have to pick an integer for m for the boundary conditions to be satisfied here. And we can pick an integer uh, value for p, because that's how we index the roots of the bezel functions. So ultimately, we've got three integers now that in index multiple different quantum states, harmonic discrete quantum states that the electron can exist in. Uh, <clears throat> so then the full normalized wave function is just the product of all the normalized factors, which is this absolutely beautiful harmonic thing. And then taking the absolute square of it gives you the probability distributions for each one of the discrete states. We can calculate the energy associated with each one of the discrete states with this relation that we had to uh, select in order for the radial boundary condition to be satisfied. So then we can look back here at the value of A. I originally hit a bunch of constants in that right there. So then we can come down here and insert that value of A back in. So this is the relation we are solving, using to solve for the energy values and we uh, put the value of a back in, and then we can add that to the other side, and then multiply by uh, these constants, the inverse of the factors on the energy, and that gives us this relation. So not only do we have this wave function, which is beautiful and harmonic and discrete, and gives all the possible states the electron could exist in, the energy eigenstates the electron could exist in, uh, in that potential well, um, but we have the energy associated with each of those states, so we have solved our problem completely. Dietrich out.